As a guy with young kids, I've had to train myself to get up early and spend time studying God's Word and praying in the morning. And now, I'm not a morning person at all. I don't like it. So there's another thing that I've learned to do along with waking up early in the morning, and that's learn to like coffee. When I walk down my stairs to the kitchen, the first thing I do, like literally the first thing, is make me a cup of coffee. It helps get me going. Sometimes in the morning, uh, I'll get up early and go study and prepare my lessons at Starbucks. Uh, I'm one of those strange guys that just kind of sits in the corner, and I just enjoy watching people, watching how other people do things. Uh, to me, life is just kind of fascinating. I see all different types, colors, shapes, and social classes of people that come in, but they all have one thing in common. They're there for that cup of coffee. First of all, it's amazing to me that so many people will pay five bucks for a cup of coffee. And yes, before you start judging me, I know I'm one of those two. But if you're a coffee drinker, you know how important that cup of coffee is. You know, I watch people drag in and look half asleep. And when they get that cup with their name on it sometimes, you know, they kind of perk up and now their day can get started. An ordinary cup of coffee does so much. It gives you a little kickstart in the morning. Uh, for some people, it warms you up and it also breaks the awkwardness of a conversation. I meet with people at coffee shops on a regular basis. Just the simple fact that we are all enjoying coffee together breaks the awkwardness and opens up conversation. It truly is amazing how an ordinary cup of coffee can change a person's morning. I believe the same thing about the plan that God has laid out for his followers, you know, his children. Now, if you are the best looking person, the best athlete, the best singer, the richest person, or the most talented person in this room, I'm here to let you know that I think God can still use you too. But as we read the Bible, we see that typically God doesn't use that kind of person. He uses the guy that doesn't talk very well to lead his people out of Egypt. In John 4, we hear about a woman that was an outcast because she had numerous affairs and husbands. But she ended up having a huge part of leading many people to believe in Jesus. We see several young men, maybe even teenagers, who had ordinary jobs like fishermen. These are the guys that Jesus left to spread the gospel. Jesus is in the business of using ordinary people to change the world. If you're not the smartest, best looking, the most talented, and you're the type of person that God typically uses to change lives. Over the next four weeks, we're gonna look into the life of Nehemiah. I think God is gonna stir something up in some of you and the world around you will not be the same. This is exactly what happened to Nehemiah. He was this ordinary guy that had a heart for helping his people in the city. So he decided to do something about it. So who was Nehemiah? Well, in the first chapter, it tells us that he was a cupbearer to the king, King Artaxerxes. Well, what in the world is a cupbearer? Well, Nehemiah wasn't a priest. He wasn't a prophet, a king, or a warrior. He was a cupbearer. He had the job of tasting the wine before the king did. Now, some of you might think, that's a great job. The problem is the reason he did this was just in case someone tried to poison the king, he would die instead. So if you like wine, it's a cool job unless someone tries to poison the king and then when you die, it's not a very good job, it's bad. So basically, he was a glorified butler. Nehemiah was just an ordinary guy who heard about something that deeply troubled him and bothered him and God raised him up to change his world in only 52 days. So let's look at Nehemiah chapter 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now happened in the month of Kislev in the 20th year as I was in Susa, the citadel. Now let's pause for a second. Some of you are already lost. You're wondering, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Nope, no Kislev. What the heck is that? Well, some commentaries say Kislev is the ninth month, like November, December. It's the winter time. This is the time of the year that, you know, you and I are celebrating um, Christmas and putting up decorations. And, uh, but I doubt they were doing that since this was a year 444 B.C., which is 400 years before the birth of Christ. Um, and Susa was the winter home for the king. Uh, it's also modern-day Iran, just so you get an idea of the geography uh, of where this is taking place. So let's dive back into Scripture. Now, it happened in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa the citadel, that Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, concerning Jerusalem. They said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by fire. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and I wept and mourned for days and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Now let's pause once again and break this down uh, and understand what's going on. The walls of Jerusalem have been down for about 140 years and this was a tremendous embarrassment to the people of God. Not only was it embarrassing, but it left them vulnerable for attacks from other, other people groups. So they had no hope and they were depressed. 
A few years ago, my brother's house caught on fire and they lost everything. That is one of the most deflating things and you just feel defeated. And it's hard to have hope when you're watching everything you have worked for go up in flames. So this is where these people were. They thought life is never gonna get better. The walls of our city are broken down. Well, how did this happen? Well, you have to know a little bit about the Old Testament to understand the full story. So in a very short synopsis, God told his people, if you obey me, I'll bless you. If you disobey me, there will be consequences. Well, God's people kept wandering away from God and started worshiping false gods and idols and lots of other things that were displeasing to God. So God allowed the Babylonians to come in and wipe the city out, tear down the temple, tear down the walls, and took the people into captivity. Some years later, when Persia became the dominant world power, they let some of the Jewish people go back to their city. And they tried to rebuild the temple, but it was nothing like the temple before. Uh, but it was the best they could do so they could resume worshiping God. But their walls were still down and they couldn't seem to gather the people to rebuild them until one man, one ordinary cupbearer, heard about the issue and decided he's got to do something about it. About a year ago, Jody and I were leaving the Summit Woods area and stopped at the red light. I was looking over and I see this guy on the border creeping around cars. He checked the handle over on the cars and had a gas tank with him. I didn't know what he was doing and saw that he was trying to break into cars or something, uh, siphoning gas into someone's car. So I look over and people on the patio, they're watching this guy and they're pointing at him, but nobody is doing anything about it. Now I sometimes act rationally, okay? Um, and I don't think things all the way through. So this is this time I prayed about it. Okay, not really. I just whipped our minivan around uh, and I pulled into the parking lot of, on the border. And oh yeah, I ha also have Jody and the kids in the minivan with me. So I slammed the van in the park right in, uh, in the park right in the middle of the parking lot. I jumped out of the car and yelled the guy. I'm, I'm sure it was something very polite, like you know Jesus loves you. And the guy takes off running around the building. And I see him run in the front entrance of on the border. So I go in the side door, and all the people are pointing to me, saying he's in there. He went that way. Um, and they said they had been watching him for a while. And I'm sitting there thinking. Why didn't somebody stop him? Why didn't somebody do anything about it? But whatever. So I proceeded to look for the guy and I see him at the front of on the border. I confront him in a very calm manner. And I get right in his face and said, what's your problem, man? And you know, what are you doing out there? And he tried to get up and leave. So I got in front of him in the door and I said, you're not going anywhere. And I was fired up. Well, then the manager comes over because I kind of caused a stir. And he asked me, what's going on? And I tell him what was going on. And they called the cops. It ended up being some kind of family issue. But you know, once I got out of there, I, I knew I was out of the loop. And so I, I didn't stay and see what was going on. Um, but what I did realize is that I saw a problem. Somebody had to do something about it. It might as well be me. So let's go back to Scripture. I see the mindset in Chapter 1 of Nehemiah. And I want to show you a couple of principles from Chapter 1 and 2 of how God uses ordinary people to change the world. First thing that I see from Nehemiah is that he hears about a problem and he actually cares about it. In verse 4, the Bible says that he sat down and wept. He was so burdened, so bothered by what he heard about his land that it led him to weep, mourn, fast, and pray for days. It would have been really easy for him to dismiss what he heard. He was a thousand miles away from Jerusalem, so he could have said someone else needs to handle that problem. That's probably what I would do in that situation. And if you're honest, that's probably what you would do also because we do it all the time. Are there things that really bother you? What makes you ache inside? Maybe it's when someone at school bullies another person or the hurting and hungry children across the world that don't have clean food and water. Maybe it's human trafficking and people using young teenage girls as toys for other people. Maybe you have a real burden for reaching your friends for Christ. Um, or maybe you have a burden for our church. When you start opening up your heart to the problems and the hurts around you, you start to get passionate about things. You might even start wondering, well, why does anybody else care about this? Well, I think it's because God's, God has laid it on your heart. It's your mission. It's what you care about. You might start thinking like Nehemiah and say, someone has to do something about it. It might as well be me. Look at how Nehemiah handled the issue. Though he heard about the walls being down and truly cared about it, the problem, and it bothered him, but then he did something that I believe is a good example for any of us in any situation. First, he sat down, he cried, and he prayed. Let me just tell you, if you have a burden for something, whatever it may be, sitting down and praying about it is always a great first step. Most people dismiss a big problem and say, I can't do that, it's too big. But when you start really caring about something, your heart breaks over it and you start talking to God about it. What I have found out is that you plus God always equals a majority. There is no task too big for you. You plus God is enough to handle any situation. You might say, well, I'm just a 15-year-old girl. I can't dig a well in Africa. Well, you're right, but God plus you can. I'm just an 18-year-old guy. I can't lead my friends to Jesus. And you're right, 
but God plus you can. So the first thing we see in Nehemiah is that he truly cared about the problem. And second, he didn't just hear about it and continue to have prayer meetings. He decided to act. Ordinary world changers do something about what God has laid on their heart. He spent significant time on his knees praying, but now it's time to act. It's time to move. So he went to the king and decided to see if he could get the okay from the king to go take care of the problem. And the Bible actually said that he was terrified to go to the king because who knows what would happen. He might be killed on the spot. So let's take a look at the conversation between Nehemiah and the king in chapter 2. Early the following spring in the month of Nisan, during the 20th year of King Artaxerxes' reign, I was serving the king his wine. I had never before appeared sad in his presence. So the king asked me, why are you looking so sad? You don't look sick to me. You must be deeply troubled. Okay, let's pause. Obviously, Nehemiah had a joy by him on most occasions, and the king noticed. I think this is a great reminder for us that the people around you are watching how you act and handle yourself. Are you always grumpy or mad or always griping about something? Nehemiah didn't normally act like this, and so the king noticed a different demeanor this time. Okay, let's pick back up. Then I was terrified. Verse 3, but I replied, long live the king. How can I not be sad? For the city where my ancestors are buried is in ruins, and the gates have been destroyed by fire. Verse 4, the king, the king asked, well, how can I help you? With a prayer to the God of heaven, I replied, If it please the king, and if you are pleased with me, your servant send me to Judah to rebuild the city where my ancestors are buried. Okay, so once again, notice what Nehemiah did when the king asked him what he needed. He prayed. Are you seeing a common theme in Nehemiah's life? Now, this wasn't a long, drawn-out prayer. This is one of those quick ones. This is what I call shotgun prayer. Lord, please help me say the right things here. You know, we need to learn to do these kinds of prayers. It would probably help us not to say stupid things in some situations. Verse 6, the king with the queen sitting beside him asked, How long will you be gone? Uh, and when will you return? After I told him how long I would be gone, the king agreed to my request. I also said to the king, If it please the king, let me have the letters addressed to the governors of the province west of the Euphrates River, instructing them to let me travel safely through their territories on my way to Judah. And please give me a letter addressed to Asaph, and the manager of the king's forest instructed him to give me timber. I will need it to make beams for the gates of the temple fortress, uh, for the city walls, and for the house for myself. And the king granted these requests because the gracious hand of God was on me. Now, Nehemiah didn't know how all this was going to turn out, but he knew he had to do something about his city. So he went to the king and he asked for permission to go back to Jerusalem and help. But then Nehemiah even asked for some resources to help build it. And remember, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take, so might as well go for it. Some of you this month are going to have something on your heart, and you're going to have everything and everyone trying to stop you. And you might say you can't do it, but you're going to say, I am an ordinary person, but me plus God equals majority. I think one of the most significant verses in this passage is verse 5. If you are pleased with me, your servant send me to Judah to rebuild the city. Somebody has to do something about it. Might as well be me. A few weeks ago, there was a story that I heard that I was really intrigued by. And many of you probably heard the same thing. It happened in Houston, Texas, in Game 4 for the American League Division Series. You know, your Royals were on the brink of elimination. They were down to 6-2 to two in the top of the eighth inning, and hope was pretty much gone. The governor of Texas had already sent out a tweet congratulating the Astros on advancing to the next round. The odds of them winning were less than 2% and they had given up a big home run in the bottom of the seventh inning that put the game at 6-2 to two with only six outs left to play in their season. And some of the players talked about what happened in the dugout after the seventh inning. The Royals third baseman, Mike Moustakas, decided he needed to rally the team. He saw a problem and took it on himself to do something about it. He starts shouting in the dugout, we're not losing this game, we've come too far to end like this. Evidently, this got the team excited and believing they could actually win. In the next half inning, the Royals rolled hit after hit and even came up with this saying, keep the line moving. Before you know it, the game was tied, and then in the ninth inning, they tacked on a couple more runs to win that game 9-6, to six, and then to go on to win that series, and then the championship series, and then, obviously, the World Series. Now, we're not sure what sparked Moustakas, but he saw an issue. He saw a very talented team about to be eliminated and said, not on my watch. There's a problem, and someone has to do something about it. It might as well be. Over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the rest of Nehemiah's story and the incredible things he accomplished, how he rallied his people and got them working together and rebuilt the city walls in 52 days. This is mind-blowing how fast the people accomplished this. 
But remember, you plus God can do extraordinary things. We see that Nehemiah saw a problem and really cared about it. What is God laying on your heart? Are you, are you dismissing it? Or do you really care about it enough to mourn over it and pray over it? Let me just tell you, if you don't care enough to pray about it and ask God to help you with it, uh, then you have one of two problems. Either you're missing a relationship with God or you don't really care about the problem very much. Nehemiah was broken for his city, but then he said it's time to do something about it. What is God calling you to do about what is on your heart? I truly believe that God is going to stir up something in your heart over the next few days, weeks, months. He's going to lay a burden on your heart to do something, and I want to ask you, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to get an adult or a parent to handle your situation? Are you going to come ask one of our pastors here and ask us to do it for you? Are you going to just ignore it because it seems too big for you? Whatever it may be, something big like helping hungry kids across the world or talking to a friend about Christ, maybe starting a Bible study at your school or serving more at the church. What is God laying on your heart? Are you going to have someone else take care of the problem? Or are you going to do what Nehemiah did and say, send me? One of my favorite passages in the Bible is Isaiah 6. When Isaiah saw the Lord and the Lord asked him, who is going to be my messenger? And Isaiah answers and says, here am I, Lord, send me. My prayer for our ministry over the next few weeks is that God would lay a heavy burden on your heart. A burden that is yours and nobody else's. Luckily, God is in the business of using ordinary people to accomplish extraordinary things. You can be an ordinary world changer just like Nehemiah. I hope you enjoy our video series over the next few weeks as we look at what Nehemiah accomplished. And I hope you are challenged to do something great for God. Remember, you plus God equals the majority. Someone's got to do something about it. Might as well be you.